Holy Gospel according to St. Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. As soon as they left the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they told him about her at once. He came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. Then the fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening at sundown, they brought him to him all who were sick and possessed with demons. And the whole city was gathered around the door, and he cured many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. In the morning, while it was still very dark, he got up and went out to a deserted place, and there he prayed. And Simon and his companions hunted for him. When they found him, they said to him, Everyone is searching for you. He answered, Let us go on to the neighboring towns, so that I may proclaim the message there also. For that is what I came to do. And he went throughout Galilee, proclaiming the message in their synagogues and casting out demons. Word of God, word of life. Have you not known? Have you not heard? Has it not been told to you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth that God has a plan? God has a plan and purpose for you. And your life and this week's message goal is that it is service. It is service. It is a service that indeed sets us free. Early on when I was training under Pastor Dawson, he had this really funny saying about preparing ourselves for parish ministry. He would say that the best education outside a seminary would be to uh, work at the customer service center at, in Cole's department store. <laughs> and then I thought about that. What does it mean to serve behind a customer service window? Well, I can imagine there's probably a lot of unpleasant times. I'm sure, however, there's a lot of other moments where people understand and, you know, they understand where you're coming from and that you acknowledge that you know where they're coming from and what they need. I think that sense right there of understanding is a lovely thing that you learn over time. It's something that just over time you develop. It is a very freeing thing, a freeing thing for the spirit as well. What do I mean by freeing through serving? It's a matter of perspective, a matter of perspective that comes from the heart that God's love shapes us to see and experience. This perspective is not looking at it like, oh, I hate working, it's such a chore, or that cartoon where the guy's on the couch like going, work, you know, under the covers. Mm -hmm. You know, a burdensome task, no, you know, it's miserable, I'd rather be in my hammock with a nice tea, etc. This is a perspective you develop when you have that sense of seeing your life as both a devotion to God and a vocation of love and mercy to others. Just thinking of Mother Teresa, that woman was amazing. She was profoundly giving of herself and she was so dedicated. And from what was told of her personality, <clears throat> she never showed that weight of responsibility as being a burden, more than it being a delight, because it was her gracious response to God's love, and she was in turn loving her neighbor. This morning we have received new members, new and affirming members into our church family here. We gather together to inspire one another to serve. I'm sure everyone is getting their feet wet into their new board ministry roles. We need to keep, be encouraged here, keep encouraged here, that there's a lot of things that we need to do. But we will show the world our mighty team spirit and getting them accomplished. This past week I gave a talk on spiritual retreats at a women's UCC gathering. You probably should know that by now, that my passion is in spiritual formation. I love helping people. I love caring for them, and it's freeing for me. The one thing that's wonderful about being able to offer a retreat for a congregation to attend is that it is the ultimate form of service and sharing. It's sharing of your witness, 
and faith through what God brings to us to, for our hearts to grow from. All of today's scriptures seem to have that day in a life note to them. We have a fantastic, wonderful, inspiring message from Paul telling his Corinthian flock, I have become all things to all people. I think that's the best summary of what it means to stretch yourself to be able to help others. He continues to say that he did this so that he may save some, as well as he did it for the sake of the gospel, so that he may share in its blessings. Blessed to be a blessing. That was another wonderful learning nugget that I got uh, studying under Pastor Dawson. When you think of that, what that means. It's a lovely affirmation and a freedom of the self to be able to give to others. The Gospel text is another scene of Jesus off and about healing. He's doing the work of ministry. We do hear the message of him being the great healer, the great physician, but it is even so much more than that. When he heals Simon's mother-in-law, the fever left her and she gets up and begins to serve them. We may dismiss that sentence at first, but when you think about what all, the te all these texts are gravitating to say this morning, they are talking about that wonderful biblical Greek term called diakonia. Diakonia literally means service. Truth be told, one of my greatest experiences before I began seminary was in the program of that same name. I served as well with Pastor Dawson and the deacon of uh, our church at the time on the steering committee for that program because outside of spiritual formation, I also love education. Well, I've been doing a lot of studying this past week. <laughs> this program in particular was like a series of connected uh, Bible study type classes that were just a little more advanced uh, to than just a Sunday study after fellowship. These classes were to help people, prepare people to seriously consider moving on to a more formal biblical education. As one friend <coughs> called it, it's seminary light. Now, I think that's a little intense, you know, it should be light, light seminary. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's a very uh, great program. We've been hearing it, uh, though, as well, to be in the know in regards to being Christian is being willing to grow, <coughs> know to grow. Our hearts and our minds need to grow together to be able to see that full picture completely. We need to see the full picture to what people need. And what we must do is our part of helping the greater good of humanity. I love how Paul's letter begins, you know, the Mr. Run-on sentence with one period, some five sentences later. He uses that wonderful word, if. If is that wonderful convenient word that is so conditional and is so much about our struggle, if. This struggle is, are we going to look back and learn from the past? And are we going to look forward and realize that we all have been entrusted with a commission to serve one another out of love for God? These things are important. I have to admire my husband's bravery for doing an opinion poll survey place every day. He has to do lots of surveys, calling something like 500 numbers and asking them some very personal questions at times from a list that he has to ask and, you know, from, and of course people are very hostile about his calling and, and out of maybe, what, 500 something calls, uh, maybe you get one or two surveys done in six hours in a day. <laughs> the few he would finish would be from somebody who realizes it's a survey for science to help with some up and coming new medicines or improving insurance, etc. So they make the time. <laughs> That takes a lot of new nature to do that, though. I would have a very hard time staying on the phone, especially if they're asking everything about me, uh, what medicines I take, uh, what 
vitamins I have, you know, how fat are you, all that kind of stuff, you know. I would try to very politely hang up on them slowly. <laughs> when you think about that, though, there's just, uh, they're just average people. They're just another average person, just like you or I. It's more than making a living. They have a certain comfort in helping others, I would, I would gather. For the others, for the cause. Truth be told, I really do love to care for people and a spiritual care situation. I had never been able to get any kind of real chaplaincy type position. I've only served in churches and through visiting angels. But there's just something so wonderful about seeing someone and praying for them, praying over them, sharing their joys and concerns. That's not a burden, it's a wonderful joy. This past week, I visited both Linda and Duane, who were in, in separate hospitals, one on the east side of town and one out on the west side of town where I live, <laughs> and Mary is nearby. <laughs> and what was uh, delightful to hear from Duane is that they will be moving finally into a home that will be the best place for both of them. I am hoping to be helping them with packing their things, and hopefully people here will be able to help. Um, since they're not really in the condition to be packing and moving things themselves. This coming week, I'm not going on vacation, though it seems that way. I will be going back to not only visit my parents and see how poorly my dad is doing, but I will be trying in desperate efforts to help a friend of mine to find storage for him and begin moving things. For the past several weeks, I have had a GoFundMe campaign for him for people to help build funds for him so he won't be homeless. After 20 days, I had only one donation, but then that changed in the mail yesterday when I got three donations, so it made a little bit better for him. Truth be told, it's going to be a lot of hard work next week, as well as I have to find my winter clothes wherever they are in my closet. I'm taking advantage of this nice weather. I have Bermudas on underneath here. <laughs> I will be hitting the ground running as the saying goes. And, and helping him move dozens of boxes and things into storage. I will be helping to pay for some of the storage too. Most importantly, being there this week, I am hoping to raise his spirits. The last few times I've talked to him on the phone, he is panicking and uh, not in a good place. He's overwhelmed by this task ahead of him. Sometimes though, life truly calls you to do things like that, to reach out and help, even if it is a burden or it's going to be stressful. You know, I have a lot to prepare with my mother, and uh, if my dad has to be going officially into having dialysis treatments and things like that, um, her, her mental condition of handling all that has not been very uh, strong. On the lighter, more humorous note, uh, a couple of years back, my husband and I took a congregant in for several months when her husband had died, and we could not get her into an assisted living facility. Little did we realize that uh, Sharon had a propensity to stay up all night long, with the TV blaring all night long, <laughs> ate almost everything in the refrigerator, even old things, and I was like, okay, maybe we should dial 9-1, and then you do one, okay? <laughs> as well as sleep like a polar bear for most of the day. After a while, I was starting to see some new gray hairs come in, and uh, the little Ben Franklin bald spot in the front of my head seemed to be growing just a little bit thinner, but we still couldn't find her a home. Uh, Debbie, the music minister for the Gathering North, was wonderful. She decided to take her turn in caring for Sharon, and she helped Sharon to move in with her sister, Brenda. After a while, of course, Sharon started to grate on Brenda's nerves. By that time, thanks be to God, both Pastor Dawson and myself could find her an assisted living facility that was in Chicago. Unfortunately, she was very unhappy about that because she wanted to stay in the suburbs. But there was no place. There was no place, other place for her at all to go into because since she was considered underage. If you're at 55 years old, even if you're chronically ill, 
you're, you can't get in an assisted living facility. Uh, in, in, well, in Illinois, anyway. I don't know what it is like out here. But I just find that hard to believe that they would make that rule regardless if someone is chronically ill. It's those things that fall between the gaps that should make us think about where we are when we think of loving service and care to others. This goes beyond the problems with our health system and it's really a human problem. If we don't take the time to truly listen to people feel where they are and you know things are missed problems are ignored with great indifference and the consequences are sometimes unbearable and regrettable when Linda was sharing with me the story of the nurse wrapping her foot too tightly and she was telling the nurse that it was really hurting and then she showed me these horrible pictures of her toes blue dark blue you know, like the, the color of Carla's uh, shirt, it was that blue, you know. Um, and then a big blister the size of a softball at the top of her foot. I just couldn't believe that the, the person didn't listen to her and kept wrapping her foot tightly anyway. But then it was just like when we were networking with these various assisted living facilities for Sharon, some of the questions they would ask were so ridiculous. It was sad. Outside of them expecting five grand plus a month for someone to just stay in a small little room and have some nursing care or just, you know, supervision, they claimed that she didn't qualify simply because she wasn't old enough or that the health insurance plan wasn't exactly the right one and so on. What is the person supposed to do? What if my husband and I couldn't take her in or Brenda couldn't take her in? Would she have been homeless? That is one of the things I have found so sad moving out here. Of course, there's homelessness in Chicago. Don't get me wrong, I've seen it. But I can't believe there's like whole tent cities here north of the Strip, as well as sadly way too many silent faces and people quietly pleading for help nearly at every other major intersection down over here. When I was driving to my first seminary, which was on the south side of Chicago, uh, I used to get off uh, the expressway at a really rough intersection. It was one that you were praying for the green lights so you could just keep going. And, you know, it was frightening sometimes to be stuck at the light where your next to a person was pleading for help, but in a hostile way, you know, like, give me some money or else, you know. I wound up many a times opening the window just a little slither and sliding a dollar out and, you know, uh, praying that the light would change pretty soon. Here it's much more of a sad thing to see. And I really wonder, what's being done? What's being done is restorative justice to reach out to those people. To say you're for the common good, but bracket and blanket situations that don't reach people in between the gaps, you're not serving all concerned. And like you were saying earlier this morning, you know, the neighbors given McDonald's and stuff, and they're not really helping. It's a kindness, but I mean, somebody should be going there and say, how can I help you? Do you need to find the, the next the shelter up the road or... You know, what? somebody needs to be going out and reaching those people. All that can be done, all that can be a heavy burden on some of compassion. But just like the beautiful hymn we sang about the eagle lifting us up on his wings, God is lifting us up. As the psalmist says, it's the great rock and foundation of God as our creator, a loving parent that sustains us to be able to be free to minister to others. I can truly say I so profoundly identify with what Paul says in his letter. For I do feel that I have become all things to all people. And I have done it truly for the sake of the gospel, so that I may be a blessing to others. I do feel blessed by being a blessing here as your pastor and caregiver, bended ear, creative person. 
Run in such a way that you may win it. Life, yes, is a rat race, but the true prize I get is knowing that I can do something. I choose to love my neighbor freely with what God has given me in many spiritual gifts. Part of wading through that rat race, ah, I kind of had to say that 12 times fast, you know, is recognizing evil and know how it is a stumbling block to many things we do. Evil can be something that overtakes us when we in turn turn a different, indifferent eye to one another. Or when we claim that hell doesn't exist or Satan is not real or that Christ is just an anonymous mist. Do not lose yourselves into the ways of the world. Live beyond them and into the kingdom of God. It's so easy to do, it's so convenient, seems intellectually right. But it is the furthest thing from our true purpose and commission as freely responsible disciples of Christ and his gospel. We must be the good news ambassadors of his body in the world through beyond this world thinking and living. Let us pray. Gracious and loving Lord Jesus, help us to realize our potential in our capacity to love our neighbors. Help us to realize that change and growth needs to begin through being willingly accountable to others. Help those lost in the world see the commission you need for them to embrace. May we truly become all things for all people for your gospel's sake. Amen.